Thanks, everyone, for coming out here tonight. My name is Sam Patterson. I'm from the Charles Koch Institute, and welcome to tonight's event. The conflict in Syria and the disagreement over the appropriate American response has been a dominant topic of discussion in recent weeks. You might have heard something about it. But the central question in the debate, what is the proper role for the United States to play in the world, that question is as old as the Republic itself. Whether enlarging its territorial borders, uh, deterring the British and French impressment of its sailors, or intervening in foreign wars, Americans have long wrestled over the extent to which the United States should use its military might in order to promote U.S. policy, priorities, and interests around the world. In his often cited farewell address, George Washington warned his countrymen about the insidious perils of foreign influence before advocating a policy of neutrality that would <clears throat> um, a policy of neutrality that would keep the country out of permanent alliances. Thomas Jefferson advocated a similarly cautious tone when proclaiming the merits of peace, commerce, and honest friendship among all nations, entangling alliances with none. But our world has changed since then, and so have we. We're the world's only remaining superpower. We face fiscal burdens and a populace that appears skeptical of any new conflict. Are we a nation that, in the words of John Quincy Adams, goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy? Or are we still, in the words of John F. Kennedy, willing to pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, in order to assure the survival and the success of liberty. This evening, we will hear about the impact that foreign intervention has on well-being, both at home and abroad, and continue the discussion about when it is in the U.S. national interest to do so. As the more than 1,000 alumni of the Charles Koch educational programs could tell you from firsthand experience, we welcome debate, an, uh, analysis and scholarship on various public policy issues. The decision to intervene in foreign affairs is an area that will benefit from the fullest discussion and the widest range of viewpoints, and tonight's discussion is a part of that process. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists, as well as our partner for tonight's event, the National Review, uh, and their editor, Rich Lowry, for moderating. And now I'd like to turn it over to someone who has been outspoken on this issue, the junior senator from Kentucky, Rand Paul. Thank you. All right. This is sort of a bizarre setup. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to stand here or stand here. I think I'm standing here, but you know, if I stand up there, I can actually see my notes. I lost my vision somewhere along the way when I got old. So I think I was picked because I was undecided about Syria. They, want, they, they wanted somebody to be objective and who wasn't quite committed, kind of, you know, going in the wind. So anyway, I don't want to prejudge the debate, but I thought we'd poll the audience to begin with. How many people think and agree with the president's plan that we should bomb Syria? Uh-oh, bad news for whoever's on that side of the debate. I think something extraordinary happened this week or last week in Washington. What I think is extraordinary about it is that we actually had a debate. The president came to Congress and did what I think is his constitutional duty. He came to ask for authorization. Now, this shouldn't be that extraordinary, but in our country, often it is. Presidents have often gone to war without any authority. Now, some will say, oh, but it's just a small war. It's not going to be a big war, it's just a little war. <laughs> and then others will say, well, it's not really a war because there won't be boots on the ground. I guess really when the Japanese attacked us at Pearl Harbor, that wasn't war. 
You say that, well, heck no, that was World War II. Well, you're damn right it was World War II. We were attacked with planes. The Japanese didn't paratroop in. We never saw a Japanese soldier, but we damn sure were at war with them. You don't have to have troops on the ground. It's not war only if you have troops on the ground. But it was an extraordinary thing. We actually had a debate, and even more extraordinary, Congress debated, the pundits debated, the people debated, and the people said, hell no. We don't see an American interest. The problem with foreign policy is that most people think that the debate begins and ends when they say, our national security is threatened. Well, that's a conclusion. That's not a debate. That's the beginning of the debate. So the debate has to be, when should that occur? And so what I would like to imagine, and what I, I would like everyone to imagine, is that the initiation of war, other than a few exceptions, that's the way it should occur. We debate whether our vital interests, we debate whether our national security interests are threatened. You can't just say they are. You have a debate, and it's not always clear cut. You have to prove to me or prove to the other side that our national security is threatened. It's not enough just to say our national security is threatened. Well, what is our national security? That is a debate, and that's what we vote on. What are the exceptions to that? Well, I would think when we're being attacked or we're imminently being threatened, we have the chance to repulse an attack, whether we have a debate or not, but we should go shortly thereafter. After we were attacked on, uh, at Pearl Harbor, within 24 hours, we debated and we voted unanimously. I think the same would have occurred when we atta were attacked on 9-11. But because in Syria, we're not quite clear who the good guys and who the bad guys, or which of the bad guys are the worst bad guys, is probably a better way to put it, we ought to have a debate. Is our American interest? Is there an American interest? Is there an American ally? And I've asked these questions. If we bomb Assad, are the chemical weapons more or less likely to be used? I think it's an honest debate. I really don't know, and nobody knows the answer, but what are the chances that chemical weapons get used on Tel Aviv? I frankly think they're a greater chance if we bomb Assad than not. What are the chances that the chemical weapons fall into the hands of al-Qaeda or the terrorists, more or less, if we bomb Assad and destabilize him? I think more. What about refugees? They say refugees, a half a million have gone into Jordan, a half a million have gone into Lebanon. I ask the question, if we bomb Assad, are there going to be more refugees or less refugees? I think they'll double and triple. The whole damn country will flee when we start bombing. So I think that there is really a debate that should occur. And it should always occur. Imagine that it always occurred. We would probably be involved in less war. We would always debate whether or not our national security interests are. The president said this when he ran for office, and it was one of the things I admired about him. He said, no president should unilaterally go to war without the authority of Congress. So recently I had lunch with us, and I asked him, I said, well, are you going to abide by the verdict of Congress? To what the Constitution says, we initiate war. And he kind of hemmed and he hawed and he said, well, and actually to his credit, I think he kind of indicated he probably would, but he didn't want to be explicit. That's probably the best way to characterize his answer. That's sort of what John Kerry's kind of indicated. Yeah, probably, but no guarantees. But the thing is, the Constitution is explicit about this. Madison said that history demonstrates or the Constitution supposes what history demonstrates, that the executive is the branch most likely to go to war. Therefore, we kept that power and we gave it. We vested that power in the, in the, in the Congress, in the legislature. But that's the initiation of war. And people ask me, do you ever agree with John McCain? I say, well, he's kind of an irascible, and I can't use the next descriptor, but the thing is we do actually, <laughs> We do actually get along, and I respect him. I think he's a war hero. He spent five, six years in the Hanoi Hilton, and he deserves respect for his service. And the one thing I actually do agree with him on is the Constitution gives initiation of war to Congress, but execution he doesn't. So when many conservatives say, we don't want 535 generals, I actually have some sympathy for that argument, and I, I kind of agree. So I actually tried to convince him and some of the others that wanted to be involved in Syria that they were voting against their own understanding of the presidency. Most of them believe in an expansive understanding of the presidency that the president executes a war and should be limited. 
I kind of tend to agree. We decide to go to war or not to go to war. But once we go to war, do we want it just to be a little bitty small war? Just bombs, no boots? What happens, you know, do you really want to limit yourself in war? We, we've been talking as we came out here about some of the ways we decide when we go to war. And there was the Weinberger Doctrine. You may hear more about that. As one of the authors is here of the Weinberger, not Weinberger, the one who helped Weinberger, right? But the thing is, is what he talked about is the American public has to be behind it. We have to have a vital interest threatened or national security threatened, which is a debate. That's not a conclusion. We never know that until we debate and discuss and decide as a people, is our national security threatened? You have to have the people behind you, but you have to decide to win. I think Colin Powell said the same thing. When we are at war, we go in with overwhelming force. We go in to win. But the president has said repeatedly in Syria his goal is stalemate. Now, he doesn't quite put it that way. That's my characterization. But they, they don't see a military solution. They see a negotiated settlement. They want to degrade Assad enough that he'll negotiate. And they argue we're getting to the diplomatic solution because they threatened force. I don't know. Maybe they did. Russians say that's not why they're negotiating, but you can't always trust the Russians. Well, may, yeah, very rarely. But the thing is, is that why are they negotiating? Well, another argument is they're negotiating because some people like myself said, we have to have a debate and you shouldn't bomb a month ago. If you bombed a month ago, we wouldn't be at negotiations. Are negotiations better than war? I think so. Why? Well, one, because you're not at war. But the other reason negotiations are better is that if you were to bomb Assad, we're not going to bomb the chemical weapons. We're not going to take them away from him, and we're not going to kill him. So he will, if, once the bombing's done, Assad will still be there, and so will the chemical weapons. If diplomacy works, and I can't guarantee it's going to, but if diplomacy works, the chemical weapons will be gone. That will be a huge step forward. Will they still be killing each other? Probably. But the chemical weapons being gone would be good for Israel, good for Jordan, good for America, and good, good for Turkey. We do have an interest in trying to make that happen. What I would say is that as you move forward, if you remember nothing else about this, and I'm not sure I've said that much that needs to be remembered, but remember this. When someone says our national security is threatened, that's the beginning of the debate, not the end. And the only way you can come to a conclusion as to whether your national security is threatened is you have to have a debate and you have to persuade someone that it's threatened because it's a conclusion and it may not be obvious to everyone. You have to give examples of why you think American interests are there. That's why it's been so murky in Syria because you have people on both sides and there's no, to me, clear-cut factual basis for saying one or the other will be an American ally if they win. My hope is that when we look at war, when you look at war, when people go to war, that we go to war reluctantly that our philosophy of war is that it's a last resort, not the first resort. War's not a good thing. You know, Eisenhower said, I hate war like only a soldier who's lived and breathed and fought war. The stupidity, the banality, the futility of war. Coming from Eisenhower, who got us out of the Korean War, who had a reluctance and a reticence, it isn't that we don't have to go to war sometimes, it's that we shouldn't be eager for war. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. We're ready to embark on the second part of our program. Welcome, everyone, and welcome, everyone, watching online. I'm Rich Lowry, editor of National Review magazine. I'd like to thank Rand Paul for opening up the evening, and I'd like to thank the Library of Congress for this wonderful setting, and thank the Charles Koch Institute for partnering with us on this event. Although, in retrospect, I think perhaps our salesmanship for this event really wasn't the uh, most persuasive case we could have made. We told the Koch people we wanted to have this event that was going to be huge and hugely important for the future of the world, but the audience for it would be unbelievably small. And the event would be of limited duration and of small consequence, really no significance whatsoever. And some people might call it a debate or a discussion. But we thought that language was much too martial and aggressive and antiquated. And we prefer to think of it as a forensic action. So uh, <laughs> here we are uh, this evening to discuss America's role in the world. I think the uh, sort of my bottom line on international relations is um, that it's really, it's like nature. It's red, 
of tooth and claw. And any suggestion that you can somehow just inherently, if you sit down with enough good intentions and with lo a long enough time to negotiate that you can work out your differences is an illusion. And kind of the, the starkest example of this illusion was at least the ideology of the Soviet Union, which told us that there was fundamentally a brotherhood of man. And there's an old story about an exhibit in the Moscow Zoo where they had in the cage together a lion and a lamb. And they would show people this exhibit and say, isn't it amazing you, know, you can have a lion uh, lay down with a lamb peaceably like this. And uh, someone, a visitor once was puzzled by this, asked the zookeeper, what, how, is this, how is this even possible that you have a lion and a lamb in the same cage? And the zookeeper said, oh, it's very easy. We just chuck in another lamb every day. <laughs> and uh, I think that's fundamentally how the world uh, works. I, I have some views on, on the issues we'll discuss this evening. I will try to uh, um, hold those in abeyance in the interest of dispassionate uh, discussion and a Socratic quest for truth, uh, which we'll have up here this evening. We'll go for about 20 minutes or half an hour, and then we'll open it up to questions from all of you. So without further ado, let me introduce our panelists. On the right, we have the interventionist. KT McFarland from <laughs> Fox no, News, a former uh, uh, Republican uh, official in many different administrations. Uh, Jonathan Tepperman, the managing editor of Foreign Affairs, who is wearing astonishingly bold socks uh, this <laughs> evening, putting the rest of the gentlemen to shame. Peter Van Dorn, a famer, uh, former State Department official and author of the book, We Met Well, How I Lost the Battle for Hearts and Minds in Iraq. And finally, Chris Coyne, an economics professor at George Mason University. I'm just going to start to uh, kick this discussion off. I'm going to begin at the highest level of abstraction with the widest possible aperture, and then we can narrow it down and um, deal in some more specifics. So Chris, why don't I start with you? What do you consider to be the US foreign policy tradition? And how uh, can we best be true to that tradition, assuming that that in, it, in itself is a worthy goal? Well, the tradition itself is mixed, which is basically you have lots of rhetoric throughout the history of the United States of politicians talking about non-intervention while si simultaneously intervening around the world. Uh, and my position, instead of me telling you what I think the tradition is, my position based on practical issues, in other words, how I view the ability of government to do things, is that the U.S. government, if the goal is to achieve national security, uh, well-being of U.S. citizens, and well-being of people around the world, to engage in a principled position of non-intervention and free trade with all. By free trade, I mean not just movement in goods and services, but open migration as well. My logic behind this is, is quite straightforward, which is uh, I view war and foreign intervention as another government program, no different than any domestic government program. Uh, in fact, I view it as worse in some sense because it's, a, it's of, of the largest scale. And one of the things that, that oftentimes strikes me about those on the right, and I use that term very broadly, is that they are extremely skeptical about the role of the government domestically on a whole host of issues from education to health care to social security and so on. Yet when you move beyond domestic borders, they somehow confer magical powers upon the government. And they say, look, they don't teach our kids very well here. They're not very good at health care, but we can go abroad and not just teach other kids, not just provide health care, but design the overarching institutions that govern that society. And to me, that's a, a contradiction and, and presents some real problems. So my fundamental position on this, based, on, again, on the practical uh, way that government operates, is one of skepticism towards intervention and a position of non-intervention and integration with other countries uh, to the greatest extent possible. Thank you, Chris. KT, let me throw the same question to you and feel free to bounce off of anything that Chris said. Um, I, you know, I think that we're kind of schizophrenic on what our foreign policy is and our role in the world. And, and let's assume that we're talking about our military role in the world since Senator Paul, um, Rand Paul talked about that. Up until World War II, we didn't get involved in any international fights. I mean, we were really focused on the John Adams, you know, we do not go abroad in search of dragons to slay. After World War II, we became interventionists. I think after the creation of the Soviet Union, after we defeated the Nazi, uh, the Axis powers, we looked at the Soviet Union and said, okay, how do we deal with them in this new Cold War? And it wasn't that we would fight, 
we would contain them and we would fight proxy wars, whether it was in Vietnam or other parts of the world. And I think that's where we kind of ran into trouble because we had these limited wars, but we weren't all in on these limited wars. So we would get involved, we would think they're going to be just little wars, and of course the other side gets to have a response to whatever our initial response is. And before you know it, you're in a multi-year war that costs a lot of casualties, lives and treasures, and it ultimately isn't successful. Um, when I was in the Pentagon in the Reagan administration, President Reagan, by the way, is the only post-war president who did not get involved in these limited wars, um, wars of intervention, I call them. Central and America? Reagan really, after the Vietnam War, the United States was, was really gun-shy about any military involvement. Um, we were contemplated getting involved in the Middle East after the Beirut bombing where, of the Marine barracks in Beirut where 241 American Marines were killed as they slept in their beds by what turns out to have been the first suicide bomber and Hezbollah action in the Middle East. Reagan did not want to get involved in these wars. He wanted the bigger picture, which was the takedown of the Soviet Union, and he wanted to do it economically, not militarily. And he did it ultimately by driving the price of oil down. And the Soviet Union depended on oil being at about $40 a barrel. Once it fell below $40 a barrel, they couldn't meet their payroll. So Reagan, through a number of, of actions, got the price of oil to go from $40 a barrel to $18 a barrel in nine months. And the Soviet Union was broke. At that point, Reagan said, now I'm going to challenge you to a Star Wars space race, nuclear you know, an arms race. And the Russians, the Soviet Union, knew, knew it couldn't. So at that point, we kind of got out of the business of limited war. We had won the Cold War. We were a sole superpower. And then after September 11th, we got back into the business of limited war. Um, and I think that's where we have had some real problems. And that's why I think that there's a, basically a, a major civil war in the conservative movement today between the interventionists on one hand, who think that we should intervene for various reasons, humanitarian assistance, our economic interests, whatever, and the people who say, you don't get into a fight unless you're prepared to do whatever it takes to win it. And that's the debate we're having today. I mean, that's why this is an amazing turnout for people to, on a topic which sounds like it should be, you know, maybe 30 people in a graduate seminar somewhere. And it's because we are having the rightful debate. And I think that's why it's so important that we get it right this time. We have now, we have now just come off of a decade where we have had two interventionist wars which have not ended well. We've had a third one under a, a Democrat president. Libya hasn't ended well. And we're now contemplating a Syrian intervention, which the most of the American military retired and current will tell you has no chance of success. Thank you, KT. Peter, let me get your, your basic uh, take on this. And uh, w one point that occurs to me is, um, I think it's a little bit of a myth that uh, we were a, a peaceable people content to live on the eastern seaboard for the rest of our existence at the beginning of this country. One, because in you know, 1803 and 1805, we went overseas to slay a monster in Tripoli. And if you ask the, um, the Spanish, the French, the uh, Mexicans and the American Indians, if we were a peaceable people who were content to stay on the eastern seaboard, their answer would probably be no. The, uh, the word tradition is an interesting one because it implies a organized system of thought pattern and things like that, whereas America's nearly constant interventions are really a, a series of, of random lashing outs, sometimes for empire in the Spanish-American uh, war and certainly uh, against the Native Americans, sometimes for reasons that remain particularly unclear, such as with respect to uh, the Grenada intervention during the Reagan administration um, or during the Reagan administration's interventions uh, throughout Central America, and of course the Marines in Beirut, which also counts. Um, what we've seen, however, is an almost turning on its head of the typical dynamic where you have interventionism on one side and isolationism on the other. And this is oftentimes being thrown up now by people who, who want to encourage additional interventions, Syria and other places. In fact, what has happened historically, and it's accelerating now, is that American intervention has actually created a new type of isolationism, where we find ourselves increasingly without allies, without support, and with other nations actively working, nations that used to be at least neutral, our friends, actively working against us. It was very significant that the British Parliament voted against supporting the United States in the Syria intervention. 
Um, Iraq was a arm-twisting uh, attempt to get people into the coalition of the willing. Uh, when I was in Iraq, uh, I briefly met, the, I think, the Fijians, the Italians, and the uh, six people from uh, uh, Tunisia or something that were there. Um, and as you look through this, you find America becoming increasingly isolated and increasingly finding itself acting alone in that sense of isolation. And in thus, I think it's time to take a look at this erratic history of intervention and ask ourselves, as we're doing tonight, is this in fact in our national interest or are we in fact eating ourselves? Thank you. Jonathan, reactions to anything you've heard and feel free to uh, give your answer. Well, let me try and start by uh, making a few stipulations and general observations. Uh, first of all, I almost never get the opportunity to say this, so I really want to say this tonight. I agree with a number of things Senator Rand Paul said. Number one, <laughs> debate is good. Number two, war is bad. Number three, the key is how best you serve the national interest. Now, I may disagree with some of the details of Senator Paul's comments, including whether Congress is the ideal venue in which to have these debates, especially if you want to have an answer any time in this century. Nonetheless, I think the principles are sound. Now, let me throw out a few statistics which are going to amplify um, what I think some of my colleagues up here have already said. Number one, intervention is a tradition as American as apple pie. Um, there have been, since the founding of the Republic, 243 cases where American presidents have sent <laughs> U.S. troops abroad. Uh, that means there have been three presidents who haven't dispatched troops to foreign conflicts. Those are Washington, Taylor, and Harrison. The first of those three pretty distinguished, the second two not so much. Candidates tend to campaign uh, on the principle that they are going to be different, that they are going to break from that tradition. Um, uh, that's candidates on the right, like George W. Bush, and candidates on the left, like Obama. Things then change when they enter office, and the question is, why? So here it becomes important to think like a, a policymaker, I think. Um, so what helps shift presidents' thinking once they get into to office? I don't think it's that they become mad uh, for power or uh, succumb to bloodlust, uh, and nor do I think that it's a, a desire to expand the American empire, whatever that is. Um, rather, I think they're confronted with uh, a number of facts that may be easier to avoid when you don't have your finger on the metaphorical military button. Uh, one of those is that problems, foreign problems, when ignored, have a tendency of coming to the United States, whether we would like them to or not. The second is that the United States benefits from this global, liberal, generally rule-based order that the United States spent great blood and treasure at the end of the Second World War creating. And therefore, it's in the interests of US presidents from whatever parties to do what's necessary to buttress this, this, uh, this, this system because uh, it profits the United States in so many ways. Um, and third, the United States also profits from the position of overwhelming hegemony, which it still currently enjoys. And so that may provide an additional reason for acting uh, on the simple theory that if we don't, someone else may, and the chances are they are not going to act uh, in the way that we would like them to. So those are my sort of general observations. But then I think it's important to dig down a little bit and to get into how presidents make their decisions. Because there is no doctrine, no American doctrine on intervention. There never has been, despite all the talk about presidential grand strategies. All chief executives make their decisions on an ad hoc basis. And they do it by asking, I think, three basic questions. Do you want to do it? And that means, that, sorry, that, that reflects the inclinations of the present commander in chief. It also takes into account recent experience. So the, uh, we are now suffering from the hangover from Iraq and the legacy of Benghazi. In the 1990s, the uh, legacy that helped uh, affect the president's thinking was a very different one, and that was the failure of America to act in Rwanda, where the United States essentially stood on the sidelines as 800,000 civilians were butchered with machetes. So, 
These are the kind of things that speak to a president's inclination. Then you have to ask the question, can you do it? And here are things like military capacity, things like economic capacity, both of which are very live issues at the moment come into play. The president also has to look to domestic support and international support and the likelihood of a good outcome. And finally, the question is, must you do it? And here I think if the answer is yes, presidents will find a way, no matter what the answers to the previous questions are. Now, and, but it's here, must you do it, that the rubber hits the road. People tend to try to schematize the, question, the answer to that question, must the United States intervene? Under what conditions must the US intervene? By making, for example, distinctions between wars of choice and wars of necessity. I would argue that that distinction is highly, highly fungible. And questions like national interest can be defined very, very differently depending on what you choose to include. Thank you. So, Chris, how do you react to the contention that uh, a basically global liberal order, as Jonathan put it, is a creation of is a function of U.S. military might and therefore a function of the U.S. government, basically. Sure, so uh, I dis fundamentally disagree with the idea of that the liberal order, if you want to call it that internationally, is dependent on U.S. force to maintain. If anything, I think you can make the argument that U.S. foreign interventions do more harm on net than, than good. In other words, they are more destabilizing than they are stabilizing. That does not mean, by the way, and, and you know, a lot of people want to pin you down into a camp, as, as Peter said. You cannot make the claim that no U.S. intervention has ever worked. There's been many that have done stuff that we consider to be good things. My point is that on net, if you, if you think about how governments operate, we shouldn't expect uh, across cases them to be consistently effective. So what does this mean? I think the U.S. can do a lot, the U.S. government, I should say, should do a lot, could do a lot to both improve the lives of US citizens and international citizens. And I think it's very important to say the word citizens because one of the things that dominates inter uh, discussions of international relations is collectivism. Notice there's discussions of we, our, us, them, the national interest. Well, one of the, I think, traditions to the extent we have them in the United States is individualism. Now, of course, we have these notions of nation states and governments, but one of the things we want to focus on is individuals and the impact of individuals. These decisions have real impacts both on ordinary citizens abroad. And by ordinary, I don't mean plain, I mean non-elites, as well as domestically. And so the US can do a lot precisely because of their power to help both US citizens and other citizens. What would some examples be? Well, maybe they can stop selling weapons to questionable regimes. So I was reading a report today that in the past year, the US government sold $69 billion worth of arms to foreign governments. About 30 billion of that went to the Saudi government. Now, perhaps that will generate peace and prosperity, or perhaps it will be very destabilizing. What else can they do? They can trade with people, which we know is the best way to alleviate poverty and to make people better off. That means reducing trade barriers domestically, but also encouraging our allies, to the extent we have them, to reduce things like the European ag Common Agricultural Policy, which is perhaps one of the most devastating po uh, policies in terms of harming the poorest people in the world. We can agitate for the free movement of people, migration, which again is, is much more successful in raising the poorest people out of poverty than things like foreign aid, whether we call it humanitarian aid or development aid. So to the extent the US intervenes, it should be, with the military I mean, it should be for defense. In my, this is my position, it should be for defense. In other words, there is a direct threat to US citizens, not for other reasons. And of course, this is a contentious issue and one I look forward to discussing. And one other point I want to raise that Peter mentioned very quickly. You know, oftentimes I'm labeled an isolationist and that term's thrown around in a derogatory type way. I've never understood it. Isolationism means you don't want to interact with people. You're isolated. But if you say, look, I want to interact and trade with you. If you want to trade with me and interact, so be it. If not, that's fine. That seems like the opposite of isolationism. In stark contrast, if you are a busybody, a nosy person, it's true you are interacting with people, but then typically people don't want to interact with you if you just think about your everyday life. In other words, as Peter was saying, you lose your allies. You isolate yourself. So we have to be careful when we use this term isolationism as, a, as if somehow it's negative. Uh, and instead, well, the way I view it is, uh, you know, to talk, as George Washington said, trade with all, political ties with none. I think that's a good rule of thumb to, to live by. Difficult to implement, but 
uh, good to try to live by. Thanks, Chris. I, Jonathan, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think your point would be this global liberal order is not dependent on any specific interventions, but is dependent on the United States having a, you know, a navy that's in keeping with a, a global hegemon. Sure, that's absolutely right, because the United States, as a provider of global goods, uh, uh, does a lot of work to, uh, in specific areas, uh, to, to say, keep sea lanes open. Uh, which promotes global trade, uh, a priority that Chris just, just uh, identified, uh, that is very hard to do without warships. Um, the United States works hard to um, limit the spread of weapons of mass destruction, also very hard to do um, without a robust military. Um, I'm delighted to uh, hear um, a libertarian, if that's fair to say, um, talking about promoting trade and aid. Uh, I absolutely agree that those should be fundamental um, uh, precepts of, uh, and, and tools in the American foreign policy toolbox. Um, my argument is that they're simply not enough. Um, turning to the idea that we should stop selling weapons to odious regimes, um, it's, it's a wonderful idea, um, but you have to ask two questions. Number one, what do we get for those provisions of weapons? Uh, and in the case of the Saudis, and even in the case of the Egyptians, although this has got, become a harder argument to make in the last year, I would argue that we get a lot. The $1.5 to $1.6 billion a year that the United States has paid the Egyptian government for the last uh, X number of decades has bought something very real, which is very central to the American national interest, and that's peace with Israel. Similarly, if we stop selling weapons to the Saudis, what do you think would happen? Would the Saudis stop buying arms? No, of course they wouldn't. They would just buy them from the Russians or the Chinese instead, which returns me to a point I made earlier on, which is the benefits of maintaining U.S. hegemony, not because the United States is necessarily a light into the world, uh, but simply because if you want to roll that back, you have to ask the question, who's going to do it instead of us, and would you rather they take that job? Let me pick up on a couple of points. I mean, the first thing we would lose, of course, if we didn't sell $30 billion of weapons to the Saudis is $30 billion. Sure. And I suspect that that is a large portion of, of the, the need to do that. The, the issue that is being bandied around here, I think, is being set up as a bit of a straw man argument. No one anywhere is arguing that the United States should get rid of its military, should pull all the warships back and all that. We're still fighting pirates uh, on the high seas as if it was the 18th century again. Um, and these are legitimate uses of, of power that have been in place uh, since cavemen threw rocks at, at each other. And, and that's not what the argument here is. The argument is that when we create the impression that the United States is somehow responsible for policing the world system, we're not setting ourselves up, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, as the world's policemen. We're looking like the world's George Zimmerman. Our interventions create chaos that we then walk away from. Pick your spot. Pick an intervention that hasn't ended in some form of chaos. Um, Iraq, of course, is, is the most immediate uh, example that comes to my mind, having, having spent a year there. But let's take a look at Libya was, uh, what, only a year ago or so that uh, we intervened surgically, strategically, small bombs, whatever the, the current Vogue uh, cliche is, uh, in Libya. Um, we had our hands, hand, our tail handed to us in Benghazi and essentially ran most of the American mission out of Libya. We've pulled our special forces training teams out because it's too dangerous and their weapons are being stolen. Exxon now says they cannot operate in Libya because it's unsafe, so there's the blood for oil argument. And the Libyans are now asking for help to restore that chaos. The next point I think that, that is still worth looking at and picking up on Chris's here is the question of trade. If I had oil in my backyard, which is actually quite small and there's no oil there, <laughs> um, if I had oil in my backyard, what could I do with it? Yeah, I was about to say, I thought you lived in Fairfax. Not, uh, but, well, you know, it's uh, Texas. <laughs> uh, you know, the neighbors see me digging at night, but yeah. they never seem to, to wonder what's going on. Um, but if I had oil in my backyard, exactly what would I do with that oil other than sell it to someone? Could I eat it? Could I grow food in it? No. Gwyn Dyer, who's one of the more uh, astute and, and, and prescient commentators on national affairs, he's a university professor in, in Canada, um, raised this very point in his uh, book written just before the Iraq War, saying, what if we 
turned our back on the Middle East militarily, interventionally, stopped selling $30 billion of weapons to the Saudis or F-16s to the Iraqis, what would happen? They'd sell the oil. The oil would still be available on the international markets. The United States would still have warships to clean up the pirates. I don't think the world system would collapse. I think what would happen is the United States may reclaim a position in the world system as opposed to existing outside of it. And I think rather than being seen as the world's policeman, we might find that there were friends out there. They might be business partner friends. They might be allies. They may be something in between rather than targeting a world full of enemies. Peter, just let me push you on, on one thing, and then I know Jonathan wants to make some points, and we should get KT back in, and then, then we can open it up to questions. So did the, the interventions in the Balkans, the Bosnia War and the Kosovo War, create more or less chaos at the end of the day? Bosnia is always an interesting point, and that's uh, interventionists, uh, people who are pro-intervention, such as it is, always bring up the Balkans. Um, and I was hoping someone would bring it up tonight. The first thing, of course, to remember about the Balkans is that there were military targets that could be bombed. There were actual military things that could be done which made an intervention there possibly uh, viable. But I think the most important lesson to take away from the Balkans is not that intervention works, is that what the lesson is, is that allowing a artificially constructed nation to fracture along ethnic and religious lines is what solved that problem. The United States certainly assisted in that, and the military presence there kind of pushed the sides back. But imagine if in 2004 we had brokered a deal that allowed Iraq to separate into the three countries that it actually is. Imagine if the United States allowed the Free Syrian Army, which is actually a collection of people who, who you know, wear that like a t-shirt, to create a separate state and Assad would have a state and split Syria along its own uh, Sunni Shia political lines. That would actually represent a conclusion. The Bosnia thing is taken as the wrong example. But the wrong conclusion, you say I say. But it is an intervention that worked on your terms. You just think the circumstances were such that it that was made unique. it particularly congenial to a limited U.S. intervention. It was unique. It was specific to that place and that time. And it is not a lesson that can be applied or has ever been successfully applied elsewhere. It one and Kosovo also didn't work out? Um, those countries broke, shattered along ethnic and religious lines. And that sort of put the problem aside. We could, so we so could it did work. It worked in that very narrow capacity. The same argument was made when uh, COIN, uh, counterinsurgency, was the buzzword in, in town. Um, everyone would talk about the British in Malaya as the example. And that's fine. The British were successful in a lot of their counterinsurgency work. But it was a unique example that was blown up to justify counterinsurgency anywhere else. And so. I take your points on Bosnia, and I may have used the word chaos a little chaotically in that sentence, but the idea is, is that it is not an example that you can pick up and drop into Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Tunisia, Egypt. Did I leave anybody off the list? <laughs> I haven't seen I the news for most, an hour. I, the I haven't seen the news for an hour. There may be another one. Can I Jonathan jump in? And, oh, so I ahead, mean, this please. actually is resembling a graduate student seminar because it's an awful lot of theory and it has very little to do with the reality of what actually happens in the White House Situation Room or in the Oval Office. Nobody's talking about these grand theories. Um, I look at this since the Industrial Revolution, the, United, the world has gone to war over energy because energy is the primary component that you need for industrialization. So World War I was in part about who got to control the oil, coal fields of Central Europe. The Japanese bombed us at Pearl Harbor because they wanted access to the oil that we were no longer giving to them. Hitler invaded Russia because he wanted access to the Ukrainian oil. We had the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War over oil. Um, with some exceptions, Bosnia, Afghanistan, the major battles that we have fought have all been over energy. So when you talk about what's the United States role going to be in the world, it's not a debate we're having because we like to have it. It's what requires us to have, what, what do our national characteristics and needs require us to have as a foreign policy. As long as we need to get oil from the Middle East, we are going to be involved in the Middle East. We are going to have a military and a navy. We are going to be involved in conflicts in the Middle East. We are going to be involved in every Sunni Shiite sectarian battle that's going to go from country to country to country, from tribe to tribe to tribe for the next 50 years. That's why I don't look at this as this sort of theoretical stuff. 
look at it, how are we going to get our energy? We're either going to get our energy from the Middle East or Russia, or we're going to find our own energy. And what we have had in the last three or five years is the ability to totally rewrite all these theoretical ways of, of American foreign policy, which is we have the ability to be energy independent. If we make the decision, we would, you know, keystone pipeline, fracking, horizontal drilling, et cetera, et cetera. Within five years, the United States could be energy independent. We would no longer need the Middle East. We would no longer need the relationship with Russia. Within 10 years, we could set ourselves up as competitors, in fact, very good and strong competitors to these parts of the world, because as the Middle East continues with its sectarian killing for the next 30 years, they're going to start blowing up each other's oil fields. They're not going to get their product to market. Russia has oil in western Siberia. It has oil fields which are played out. They want to develop their eastern Siberian oil fields. To do that, they need American and western technology and foreign investment. We control that. So all these things are all very interesting, and I do think they'd be really terrific in a graduate seminar. But the reality of the fact is until the United States gets its own energy and until the world no longer needs Middle East oil or has alternatives to Middle East and Russian oil, then we're going to, have, we're going to be sort of stuck in this mindset of interventions to have access to resources. The minute we no longer need that, and we're, we're in the position of being the new Saudi Arabia, Iran of the, of the world, we're the new Middle East of the world, it changes the international dynamic of every single country. The Russians are in a very difficult position. The Middle East no longer gets their product to market because, I do, as I said, I think they're going to blow each other's oil fields and refineries up, and China and Russia I mean, China and India need access to energy. They do not have the ability to do the same kind of horizontal drilling and fracking that we do. They come knocking on their door, our new friends. So this is all interesting, but I think the bigger question is the one of energy and who has it and who has access to it, access to it, and who can guarantee getting it to market. Well, you may eventually get energy out of your backyard, Peter. Well, I'm looking for it. Uh, uh, horizontal think, drilling works. <laughs> <laughs> I think the most important question is, in counter to that, after 65 years of intervention, 243 military actions, controlling the Middle East, controlling the sea lanes, how come gas is not 30 cents a gallon? Shouldn't there be some return for all that? Shouldn't we see some progress? Shouldn't there be something that we can cite as a benefit to all this that has been done? And if you can't, other than Kosovo, which uh, um, if you can't, then you have to ask, why did we do it? And more importantly, you have to ask, why are we going to keep doing it? So Jonathan, do you want to uh, you have some brilliant thoughts to close this portion of the session before we go to Yeah, I want questions. to re respond very quickly to Katie and then to Peter on a more theoretical, you'll beg, I beg your pardon, level. Um, uh, you will be awarded credit for sitting, <laughs> sitting through this discussion. Um, in terms of your, your forecast for oil, as my grandmother used to say, from your lips to God's ears. Um, <laughs> five years to U.S. energy independence is, I think, a, a little bit optimistic, if not very we optimistic. We did it in 18 months with ga natural gas independence. Great. Let's go for it. Uh, the, the problem is that the, oil, the global oil market functions in a way that's much more complicated um, than what Katie has suggested. Oil is a global commodity, and it's a fungible commodity. That means that prices are set based on the global supply of oil, not the oil that one individual country is selling to another. So when Peter decides to sell me the oil that he's drilled in his backyard, he doesn't say, Tepperman, because I like your socks, I'm going to sell it to you for 25% off the global rate. That's, that's not a, that's the way. That's an impossible hypothetical, Jonathan, by the way. I do I like it. I don't think so, however. <laughs> I think we may work something out after this meeting. The, the problem, um, in all seriousness, is that is that uh, the, the price is set based on the global supply. So while U.S., uh, the, the, the advent of, of tight, gas, uh, t tight oil and U.S. shale gas is a great thing, the United States will remain engaged uh, with the rest of the world because if Saudi oil comes offline, uh, if Russian oil comes offline, if the Japanese are no longer to, to ship oil through the Straits of Malacca, that's going to do devastating things to the global economy because the price of oil is going to shoot through the ceiling. And that's not something that we as a country can afford. Uh, really quickly, responding to, to what Peter um, was saying, I think a lot of your points are very well taken. To try and distill the implications uh, of what you were saying into a coherent foreign policy, um, you can point to a, a, a faddish 
strategy right now that's known as offshore balancing. This is something that's put forward by guys like Robert Pape at the University is that, of Chicago. Is that academic enough for you? Totally. Good. Okay, <laughs> bear with me. John uh, Mearsheimer, uh, Stephen Walt, guys who are familiar to you if you read foreign policy or other foreign policy publications. The argument is that the United States should not be engaging in nation building abroad um, because we're not very good at it and it's too expensive and it doesn't really matter to us what happens in foreign countries. The argument is that the United States should not have troops stationed around the world because as uh, I can't remember whether it was Chris or Peter were alluding to, those troops tend to be a great source of anti-Americanism, indeed terrorism. So let's pull those guys back, men and women I should say, uh, let's put them on American mega bases like Guam or Diego Garcia, let's keep them on ships in the ocean, and let's only intervene when U.S. national interests very narrowly defined are threatened or the global balance is somehow disturbed such that we need to step in and, and reorder it. Now that policy has big advantages. It's cheap, it may indeed uh, diminish anti-Americanism in places like Saudi Arabia or the, uh, other places in the Gulf where we know that the presence of U.S. troops have been a sore spot. Uh, it's not pure isolationism because it would rely on diplomacy and the United States would reserve the rights to intervene. But my point is we need to be very, very honest with ourselves about what the negative consequences of such a policy would be. And those consequences would be among the following. The United States would have to be prepared to stand by and either uh, be uh, uh, benignly oblivious or an accomplice to the kind of carnage that's going on in Syria and to the mass slaughter of, of civilians around the world if those uh, conflicts are contained. And I'm not sure that that's the kind of country we are. Number two, threats, as I've said before, have a way of expanding, and we're seeing that in Syria now. So what starts out as a domestic conflict rarely stays a domestic conflict. Um, intervening late can be much more costly than intervening early. Again, I think we're seeing that uh, in Syria. And um, impunity spreads. So when the United States uh, or the global community if you'll forgive me for using that, that uh, painful phrase, in the form of the, the UN Security Council, NATO, what have you, allows dictators to do whatever they want. Other dictators start to get the message. And again, I'm not sure that that's what we want to happen. And for a very recent example of how that happened, just look to Syria and Egypt. I think it's very easy to see the connection between what happened in Egypt when the United States stood on the sidelines uh, as the junta, the, the military government, the, the generals as throughout Morsi's elected government and established a military government and then ignored American warnings to, uh, to, to not slaughter innocent protesters and the United States didn't respond. And what Assad subsequently did in Syria because Assad got the message that the United States is not going to make good on its commitments and is going to sit on its heels when dictators do whatever they want at home. And again, I think that's problematic and, and we may choose that that is a price that we want to pay, but let's be honest uh, about the fact that that's what we're looking at. Let me let Chris just bounce off that quickly and specifically the contention from Jonathan and you hear this pretty much from every U.S. president in some form or another, we've heard it from President Obama on Syria, that we're not the kind of country that can let this whatever the um, human rights violation is go by without acting. Sure, I think that is pure rhetoric and made up, and we know that because there's lots of human rights violations around the world on a daily basis. North and, Korea? Yeah, and uh, we don't do anything to help them. In many cases, the U.S. government helps perpetuate them. Uh, look, ultimately, this is what this comes down to, and this is one of the interesting takes, takeaways from all of this. Whether it, inter government interventions work or not is mainly an empirical issue. There are many cases, as I mentioned before, where they work. We can sit here all night and you guys can, people say these ones worked and we'll say yes and then these ones failed and those people will say yes. And then it's like, well, where does that leave us? That's ultimately at the end of the day where I come down and this is you need to think about how government operates since government carries out interventions and then determine how confident you are that government can carry out massive large scale interventions. And these are the characteristics. A group of elites or supposed experts comes up with a blueprint that they think they can intervene abroad and move people around almost like they're pawns on a chessboard to get the outcome that they want. 
Number two, massive large-scale top-down bureaucracies to carry out those plans. And number three, focus on the collective, global security, national security, as compared to individualism. What other uh, method had those same characteristics? Central planning under the Soviet Union, central planning under other major government programs. Really, foreign intervention is the new central planning. It is the idea that well-enlightened, reasonable people who are either well-educated or, or morally superior to others can improve the world around them according to their desires. And ultimately, what you need to think about is how confident are you in, in the ability of the government, given the realities of how government operates. Think US post office, right? Imagine US post office ramped up with a lot of tanks and guns. How confident are you that that's going to work effectively? That's how bureaucracy works. They, it, it does succeed. Mail gets to my box every day. But on net, not so good. How confident are you that that, that, that is going to succeed in interventions? That's ultimately what it comes down to, the ability of government to generate success or failure in these things. And that ultimately, that's why I'm a skeptic of, of these issues, purely on practical grounds. Thanks, Chris. Let's open it up. Let's open it up for questions. I don't know whether we have a mic or whether we're just going to go with uh, uh, people's voice. Yes, sir. Oh, there's a mic over here. Thank you so much. Is that on? Thank you so much, you all of you, especially Thanks for Rich, for uh, directing. My question is actually to KT, who I don't think has had very much time on this panel. You've I work in television, and we get our point across in three minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you've, you've done an excellent job at doing that, which is why I'm wondering. You've said really two fundamental things. First off, that there's a civil war in the Republican Party about these issues. And second, that most foreign intervention is based on the issue of energy and oil in particular. Uh, do Can you, you hold think the mic that, just up a little higher? Yeah. Do you think that if the Republican Party came together focusing on, as you said, we could be energy independent in five years, do you think that that would solve this rift in the Republican Party? Thank you for the question. Katie. That's a really thoughtful question. Um, yes, I think that, I mean, to me, the biggest national security interest of the United States right now would be to find our own energy, to become energy independent. And I get the thing about it's like one big bathtub and it's a straw and it's our oil goes in the bathtub and the Russian's oil goes in the bathtub <laughs> and the Iranian oil goes in the bathtub. The thing is, if the bathtub is full, the price of oil is going to come down. And although for us, I mean, it'll do a whole lot of things for our economy, it'll have repatriation repatriation of American industry. Um, it'll, it'll be an economic boom, not only in the jobs in, in relation to that, but I think that ultimately the price of oil, as these other parts of the world, their oil depletes. You know, the United States, Russia, the United States, Canada, and Mexico can become the new suppliers of the world's energy. Once you have that, then I think that the, the need and the, the requirement that the United States has to get involved in the war, the kind of wars that we've had in the last 15 years goes way down. Um, you know, people have been fighting, I mean, it's certainly in the Middle East since, you know, Isaac and Ishmael, okay? I mean, since the Book of Genesis. And they've just had a lot more money lately to have much more lethal power and lethal weapons. And so I think the Middle East is going to continue to fight to the end of time. And you'll see Shiites and Sunnis both fueled by Arab oil money, continuing to fight till the last man. They see it as a, as a religious fight to the finish. They've got the money to do it. And the fact that the oil is there is making the fight far more lethal. So I think that solves a lot of our problems. If we don't have to worry about where are we getting our energy all the time, um, I think we're in a different place. The Civil War in the Republican Party, it's the same Civil War that I saw in the 1980s where Reagan was elected for th with three groups of conservatives, social conservatives, foreign policy conservatives, and economic conservatives, fiscal conservatives, fiscal hawks. And while you had, you know, while everything was good and the money was good and you had enough money for everything, everybody got along. But by the middle 1980s, when the defense budget had cost a lot of money, while when the budgets were not balancing, Reagan had a goal of balancing the budget, he wanted to cut government expenses. He, he did cut taxes. He was not able to cut government expenses to the spending to the extent that he thought he would. Then you start having these two wings of the Republican Party fighting with each other. So the, the conservative, the fiscal hawks and the foreign policy hawks start fighting with each other. Nobody wanted to intervene places, by the way. That was an era when nobody really wanted to go to war. 
we were not looking at a war in the Middle East. We you know, had a Cold War with the Russians. But that's where you see, and I think that the modern version of the Civil War is those two groups. That part of the, of the, of the isolation, and I don't want to speak for isolationists or, or libertarians, but I think part of it is an economic-driven argument that we can't afford to do a lot of these things. Um, and the foreign policy hawks, the defense hawks, to go back to the way Reagan conducted his foreign policy, you know, Reagan had a defense buildup, but not because he wanted to use it anywhere. He felt um, very strongly that if you had a strong military, nobody would pick a fight. The way he expressed that to the American people was he talked about Jack Dempsey, which means nothing to you guys, but did 30 years ago. Jack Dempsey was a great prize fighter, and Reagan said, nobody picks a fight with Jack Dempsey, right? Because Jack Dempsey was the biggest, strongest fighter in the world. Reagan felt if you had the biggest, strongest military power in the world, nobody's going to pick a fight with you. And he would make the argument that in his lifetime, I think he, would, he said two or three wars have begun in his lifetime, never because the United States was too strong. So I think a lot of the civil war problems in the Republican Party go away when we're economically solvent again. And there may be a secondary crisis within sort of a subset of the civil war, which is the people who are the interventionists to the non-interventionists. But I always go back to, you know, Reagan won the Cold War without firing a shot because he used the economic weapon. And he picked his fights. And he wasn't going to fight everywhere all the time. He picked his fight, and his fight was to take down the Soviet Union. It was not to get embroiled in the Lebanese Civil War. It was not to get embroiled in other wars around the world. It was the takedown. And so if the Republican Party kind of goes back to its Reagan roots, that was the most successful Republican presidency since really the post, in, in the post-war period. Um, I think we do, we can patch up a lot of the fights that we're currently having. Thank you, KT. Is there a question f far off from someone who never thought he'd get a chance to ask a question? Yes, sir. <laughs> ne next to the pillar. Yes. You, sir. Yes. Um, thank you all for coming and speaking. I had a question about the idea of um, kind of not getting involved in civil wars, essentially letting, you know, countries break up along ethnic lines. Um, could you comment about that in light of, you know, the Pakistan and India partition in 1947, which, you know, has led to two very heavily armed nuclear powers and um, Pakistan's support for the Taliban and uh, organizations like that? Peter? Um, Sorry, I didn't, the, the question yeah. is, can, can you apply your point about not getting involved in civil wars and letting countries s split up along ethnic lines mm -hmm. to Pakistan, India well, partition? Well, well, yeah, because um, uh, you know, Pakistan and India, we pretty much let them partition the way they wanted to. Uh, both sides now have nuclear weapons. Um, you know, the CIA basically has two categories of concerns for WMD proliferation. There's Pakistan and everybody else, and um, you know, the Pakistan's been supporting the Taliban and things like that. Do you think that if we kind of encourage these uh, countries to, you know, kind of fight it out and leave it alone, that we won't have more Pakistan and India situations in the future? Well, well, I think maybe you misunderstood my point. The question is, why would we be involved in that anyway? Um, where is our national interest there? Um, this is the broader question, is, is what is our national interest in any particular thing you, you want to cite? You're left with these without really much of an answer. You, you kind of dig around for things like, well, global system we have to police, even though lots of other countries seem to be OK with it without policing it we get into this idea where we've got to save the children, but actually we're very selective about when, where, and how we save the children. Um, to me, if you wanted to save Syrian children, you might airdrop in lots of nerve gas antidote. Um, that might save some people, or you might send uh, medical help, help to the two million refugees on the board, as an example. The point is, is that every problem in the world is A, not in America's interest to resolve, and be not entirely possible for us to resolve. As Chris pointed out, we consistently misunderstand what we can do. We simply step into a situation that is as complicated as, as related, going back to biblical times, literally, um, or ethnic divides that were created by the British after World War I, meaning the Middle East. Um, and we think we can go in there and just kind of move the pieces around, manipulate things. We don't understand at all the complexity of these systems and I'm sorry I'm going to use the word chaos again. It got me in trouble earlier. But the, the absolute inability to dig the hole as deep as I want until I hit oil. Um, the, we, we fail to understand the, 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 the complexity of the chaos that these situations unveil, despite regular advantages. 
Um, I'll just point out, just picking up on an earlier point that one of the panelists made about um, police stopping the spread of, of uh, weapons of mass destruction. I guess we didn't do so well with that in, in Pakistan, India, um, maybe Israel, South Africa for a while. Again, this selectivity about when we do this and when we do that is what rubs out arguments with respect, Jonathan, that the United States has this sort of uber role to play. We don't, we're not very good at it. Can I just jump when it, it was sure. like 90 seconds? If you have, I think it's a fundamental role of foreign policy. If you have two enemies that are busy killing each other, do not stand up and try to stop them. Don't get in the middle of a bar Don't fight. Don't get in the middle of a civil war, yeah. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Do we have a mic over on the left side of the room? Or? Yes, that's what I'm Okay. The, the gentleman who's reaching eagerly for the mic right there, yeah, he will not be, will not <laughs> be denied. That's a bad sign. I wanted to see if I could get Jonathan to defend something he said earlier. There's this notion that we adopt offshore balancing and we're going to have to get used to looking the other way when dictators commit human rights atrocities. Um, that's been our policy throughout the entire post-war period. You know, during this vaunted uh, uh, Balkans war that was so humanitarian, we're also arming and giving money to Turkey as it slaughtered like 60,000 Kurds in the secessionist area in the southeast back up a little further. Reagan, of course, backed Saddam Hussein as he was committing chemical weapons atrocities against the Iranians and his own people. You know, we, we also had a lot to do with the massive human rights atrocities in Nicaragua, Reagan's Contras. Back up a little further, we gave the green light to Indonesia to slaughter a couple hundred thousand East Timorese. I mean, we can go on and on. The policy has been to set up dictators that we like and look the other way. And this isn't something that would happen if we adopted offshore balancing. It's our policy now and has been. Thank you. So the question basically uh, goes to double standards and mm -hmm. would we uh, be more consistent if we weren't intervening mm -hmm. whatsoever? Well, I'll, I'll make two points, um, starting with the, the last thing that the, the uh, questioner raised. Um, the, it, I think it's important to be fair to recognize that the U.S. policy is not exclusively to prop up nasty dictators around the world uh, and let them do whatever they want. There are plenty of uh, examples which, by the way, uh, Reaganites and former Reaganites are fond of citing of uh, former nasty dictators who we have managed to push in more democratic direction. And the two most famous examples are the Philippines and South Korea, which have both profited enormously from that shift in US policy. But to get to the larger principle that you raised, uh, I would be the last person to argue that the United States has always been consistent. I would, not, I would also not argue that the United States uh, needs to be consistent, but it does not follow that because we do not intervene in many cases, we should never intervene. And one of the most offensive things that I think President Obama, or disingenuous, said in one of his earlier addresses on Syria, before he decided to intervene, before he decided not to intervene, <laughs> was that because we can't intervene in a case like the Congo, we shouldn't intervene in Syria either. It just doesn't follow. There are cases where we have the capability, and there are cases where our humanitarian impulse and our national interest align. And in those cases, we may intervene. But to say that because there are other cases where that doesn't hold, we shouldn't intervene anywhere, it just doesn't follow. We have time for one more question. Who has a particularly academic question, an extremely arid, abstract, and ac academic question. I think this, this gentleman looks like he's got it all over, written all over statistic. him. We'll see if I can get there. <laughs> so um, one could argue that we have no strategy and we don't have any plan at all because every single decision is an individual decision. So we continue to trundle through a world because we don't have a, oh, sorry, I heard the thing go out, a grand strategy. A, a strategy that says this is our goal. And, and in fact, I would agree with KT that, that the fact that Reagan's overarching goal was that we we're going to stop the Soviet Union and we we're going to stop them from spreading and we we're going to we go after them economically through demonstrating a large military force is exactly what was beneficial in that time and actually carried us forward. So the question is, is the actuality that we are fighting the big government, little government argument through all of these actions? 
and that it's actually the conflict of domestic policy that makes us make these decisions. Because we choose to do domestic things when we, the left loves us to use Eisenhower's military complex, industrial complex as their argument against a large military industrial complex. But at the time, we didn't have nearly the social network that we had, the social welfare network that we have today. Mm -hmm. So one could argue that it actually, it's all about domestic policy. It's about the argument of how do I win my domestic fight through my international or foreign policy means. And that would be my question is, is it domestic policy that's actually the fight, or are we actually talking about foreign policy? Well, I'll, I'll make one point in response to that, which is, um, uh, again, uh, against Senator Paul's issues, uh, Senator Paul's preferences, these uh, um, issues are often not decided on a broad-based domestic way. They're decided by the president acting uh, in concert with a very small circle of advisors, and that's it. So it's hard to see certain conflicts that the president has uh, brought the United States into effectively on his uh, own power um, as reflecting any kind of uh, an internal battle between different camps in the United States. Any final thoughts on well, question. I think you raise an important point, which is all, by definition, all political interventions are political. And so, again, how confident are you in politics? And, the, and, and this is the interesting thing, right? <laughs> this is, that's really what it comes down to. And so, there, I think the main takeaway is there's no grand strategy. There's no national interest or humanitarian ideal floating out there that's guiding us. You're real individuals who are elected to positions of power who respond to incentives. Those incentives are the things that Jonathan pointed out, the things that KT pointed out, domestic things, as well as private interest groups, which we haven't talked about. You mentioned the military-industrial complex, which have a massive influence on the shape of foreign policy. And remember, of course, one thing we haven't talked about is these spillover effects domestically. I'm not talking about bl blowback-type issues here. I'm talking about Randolph Bourne's point, war is the health of the state. Foreign interventions breed debt. They breed a erosion of civil liberties at home. They breed new taxes and expansions in government power because of the opening created by the crisis. Look, during war, not all wars, as we just saw in Syria where the public was strongly against it, but many wars, people are unflaunting in their patriotism and they say we must support the executive. That opens up, in some sense, an opening for government to expand precisely because the check of civilians is weakened. And so we just have to be very careful. And again, I am fully on board with Jonathan's point that good stuff can come out of interventions. It's not that it's zero or one, bad or good. It really comes down again to how confident you are on net, which is a messy issue. It's not a clean cost-benefit calculus that you can write down precisely because of all the issues that the panelists have raised. But that's really ultimately what it comes down to is, is how confident you are that on net a good outcome is going to emerge. I Thanks, agree Chris. completely. All right, well, I think we've, uh, we've forged consensus this evening on the absolutely crucial issue of Kosovo, which I know you all came here to, to have settled once and for all, and then also the national imperative of trying to discover fossil fuels in Peter's backyard. But thank you all for being here. Thanks for listening so attentively. Please thank our panel. Nice to you. Nice to you. Nice to you. Nice to you. Good job, Chris. That's terrific, Rich. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that. That was a great discussion.